13 tonight, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll read verses 1 through 3 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you tonight as we come in the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, that we can have the freedom in our country to worship as we please, when we please, where we please. And Father, we pray for our country as we head into an election in a couple of days. We pray, Heavenly Father, that our freedoms would remain. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would watch over our country and protect us even from ourselves. And I pray, my Lord, for a great revival in America before the Lord Jesus comes so that folks might be able to honor and glorify him and to see folks saved. We just pray that you'd guide and direct us tonight as we have this time in your word that your Holy Spirit would not only open the lips of your servant to speak, but the heart of every person to receive the word of God, that it might challenge our hearts and change our lives, that it might make us more like the Lord Jesus and cause us to honor and worship you all the more. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God makes a big thing about love. And so should we. John, I call him the apostle of love, tells us in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. And in verse 7 he said this, love is of God. So where does love come from? It comes from God. Without God there would be, of course, nothing. But without God there'd be no love. Now, can you imagine a world without love? Can you imagine if God had just created this world and spun it out into space and forgot about it and left it to itself? As bad as things might be right now on this little blue marble, think what it would be like without any trace of love. The Bible says that God the Father loves us in John 3, 16, for God so what? Love the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, loves us. In Ephesians 5, 2, the Bible says, Walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then the Bible says that the Holy Spirit loves us. In Romans 15, 30, Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. We also find that God has actually put His love in the heart of every believer. The Bible says, And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Romans 5.5. 5. So God said, He is love. God said, God is, love is from Him. God said that if you have Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit who indwells you has shed God's love abroad in your heart. And so God tells us we're to love the Lord our God with all our soul and all our mind and all our might. The Bible says we, shall, we should love our neighbors. And God has put within us the love to do that. The wherewithal to accomplish that. The Holy Spirit desires to produce this love toward God and others in us. The Bible says, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first thing? Love. And so God said, I want to love other people through you. And God says, I want to love you. 
In our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we find in verse 13, the greatest thing is charity. Now the word charity is an old English word that is in the King James Bible, and it's a translation of the word agapao. Uh, another form of that word is agape, that's what we're more familiar with. And that means love. As a matter of fact, the same word in different places in the New Testament is translated both charity and love. So sometimes the King James translators use the word charity and sometimes they use the word love and to them those words were interchangeable. The world has a different, different definition of charity than the Bible does. Here's the world's definition. If you look it up in a dictionary it says this, number one, liberality to the poor. Number two, an institution for the help of the needy. Number three, tolerance. Number four, a gift of real or personal property for public benefit. Number five, spiritual benevolence. But I want you to notice that all of these have to do with the giving of gifts or things to help others. It's giving of things. But the Bible doesn't use the word charity in that way. The Bible has another word for that kind of giving. It's called almsgiving. So when we read the word charity here, it's not talking about almsgiving. It's not talking about charitable donations. It's not talking about, you know, some people, they don't want to take charity. They feel, it's, they feel it's demeaning to take charity. Well, they're looking at the world's definition of charity as receiving something that they haven't earned. But the word here means love. The Bible word agapao and its corresponding word agape have this definition. In respect of being used of God, it expresses the deep and constant love and interest of a perfect being towards entirely unworthy objects. This love is known by the actions that it prompts. It is not the love of complacency or affection that is drawn out by any excellency in our objects. In other words, God doesn't love us because we're lovely. God doesn't love us because we have some innate value. I want to be honest with you, the universe would continue if, if, the, if the earth just kind of, right? That's how, that's how valuable we are to the universe. But we're valuable to God because, not because of our value, but because of His love. It is an exercise of will in deliberate choice made without assignable cause. Christian love is not an impulse from the feelings and does not always run with the natural inclinations and does not always spend itself only upon those for whom some affinity is discovered. Did you understand all that? Agape love is a self-sacrificing love that gives without the necessity of recompense. Agape love because it exists. It is an unselfish, unchanging, and pure love. This is the love of God. This is the love that God has toward man. This is the love of the Lord Jesus that He demonstrated on Calvary. This is the love of the Holy Spirit that is within every believer, and this is the love that God wants extended to others through us. Amen. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. When the world uses the word charity, it speaks of giving. I want you to notice that according to verse 3, charitable giving without love is what? Nothing. Then I want you to notice that sacrificial living without love is also nothing. He says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, he is sacrificially living, and I have not love, it profiteth me nothing. While reading and meditating on the word, I noticed several things which I want to share tonight about love. Number one, I want you to go with me to John chapter 21. And I want, my first point is this, love debated. Love debated. 
And in John chapter 21, let's go to verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now we know that when the Lord Jesus asks a question, it is never because he does not already know the answer. His questions were not for his enlightenment, but for our learning. When God asks a question, he's asking it to get us to think. And so he's saying to Peter here, I want you to think, Peter, now. I want you to think hard on this. Do you love me? His questions recorded in the scripture were designed to enlighten the one to whom the question was given and are designed to challenge us as well as we read the questions ourselves. So the Lord is asking Peter these questions for Peter's sake and for our sake. Three times he questions Peter's love. Three times. Why is it that he would question Peter's love? Well, because he heard Peter's three denials, didn't he? In Luke chapter 22 and verse 61, it says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. You see, when he denied Jesus, it wasn't where Jesus was someone else, somewhere else and Peter was over here. Jesus was right there. And Jesus heard him say, I know not the man. I know not the man. I know not the man. And then Peter noticed that Jesus looked over at him. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt? Imagine how Jesus felt. Peter, you don't know me? Peter, you said in, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. And yet, he denies the Lord three times in the Lord's very presence. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 26, 56, we read that when Jesus was arrested, that all the disciples forsook him and fled, Peter included. So Peter said, though all men are offended at thee, I will never be offended. And as soon as he was arrested, Peter ran away. He fled. And then he followed afar off. And then he denied the Lord three times. Now, let me ask you, what is true biblical love? It is an exercise of the will in deliberate choice and is known by the actions it prompts. God loved us because he chose to love us. He didn't have to love us, but since he is love, he chose to love us. And because he chose to love us, and his love is true and his love is real, it prompted action. That's how we know God loves us. How do we know Jesus loved us? He died for us on the cross. How do we know God loves us? He gave us his only begotten son. And so love, then, is an exercise of the will and deliberate choice and is known by the action it prompts. Now, let me ask you this question. Did Peter's actions show that he loved the Lord Jesus? They certainly didn't, did they? If you were there and you heard what, what he said, when you heard Peter say, I know not the man, I know not the man, and then the Bible says he swore, I know not the man. Would you have said, oh, look how he loves Jesus? Is that the opinion you would have gotten? When you heard that and you watched that display, when you saw him run off when they took Jesus under arrest, and you saw him fall far off, and you heard him deny Jesus three times, would you stand up and say, I think he really loves Jesus? Of course not. 
Why? Because you'd see the actions, right? So the Lord asks him, himself, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? The truth is the Lord can see our love for him even when others can't. Now the Lord asked three times, I believe, in reference to Peter's three denials. It's almost like Saying this, Peter, did you love me the first time you denied me? Peter, did you love me the second time you denied me? Peter, did you love me the third time you denied me? And Peter's answer to all three of those was, Lord, thou knowest. The Lord was bringing Peter to a place of grief as stated in verse 17. Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? That word grieved means to make heavy or sorrowful. Listen, there are times in life when we are going to grieve the Holy Spirit by denying the Lord that we love in some way or another. You hear what I just said? There's going to be times in our lives where people would think we don't love Jesus. They would question whether or not we love Jesus. Why? Because of what they see us do or what they hear us say or how they see us act. But Jesus knows we love him. That's why Peter could say, I know it didn't look like I loved you, Lord, but you know I love you. I know they didn't think I loved you, Lord, but I'm glad you know that I love you. Amen. Lord, it grieves me that I denied you three times. But you're the one that looks on the heart. And you know that I love you. It may not be in such an outright manner as did Peter, although it may be. It may be in some situation where we're intimidated to admit that we're born again. Or it may be that we will be too afraid or squeamish to answer truthfully to somebody and say, well, I need to pray about that. You know what we'll, we'll say? We'll say, I've got to think about that. Is that all you're going to do, Christian? All you're going to do is think about it? I hope that's not all you're going to do. Are we afraid to say, you know what, I've got to think about that. I'm going to pray about that. What are we afraid of? Maybe, maybe if we said to somebody that's unsaved, you know, I need to pray about that first. You know, before I buy that, I've got to pray about it. Before I sign that, I've got to pray about it. You know what, before I consider that, I'm going to go pray about it. Maybe it just might convict them. Amen. And maybe it might say to them, wow, I don't have a relationship with the Lord like that. That I would actually tell somebody I'm going to go pray about something before I do it. I just do it. Or it may be not wanting to be seen with our Bible. I don't want anybody to see me carrying this. Put it behind my back. Or praying in public over a meal. Maybe, we're, maybe we don't want to be seen doing that. So we in, a, in the restaurant, we... I'm not saying you got to say, Dear Lord! <laughs> now, it might not be a bad idea. <laughs> if, you, if you've got the guts to do it, brother, I'll, I'll sit in the corner and go like this and say, Yay, man! So we don't have to be, perhaps do that, but we don't have to be so afraid and so intimidated that we kind of deny the Lord. That, is that what, do you pray over your meal at home? Then pray over your meal at the restaurant. If you say praise the Lord at church, then say the praise the Lord at work. Amen. So we may not do those things, but do we love Jesus? Sure we do. Sometimes we don't want anybody to know we're a Bible-believing Christian, but do we still love Jesus? Sure we do. But what I'm saying is it makes our love debatable to those who are watching and listening. Amen. I think perhaps the Lord might have had another motivation for asking these three questions because the other disciples were there too. 
And they had heard Peter's bravado and his great declaration that though others will be offended, I will not be offended. And I think that the Lord wanted to give Peter an opportunity to reestablish the fact that he did love the Lord. Maybe they were debating about Peter. Well, what happened to Peter? I don't know. He had a big mouth up there saying he would do it. Oh, offended. I'll never be offended. Well, what's up with that? I don't know. Maybe he's more talk than he is walk. You know, you can see the debate. And so the Lord said, do you love me, Peter? Peter said, you know I do. You know, Lord. Isn't that what really counts? But, we, but Peter's love was debatable by those who watched and listened. All right, point number two. Let's go to chapter 19. I want to show you love demonstrated. John chapter 19 and verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus. Now just stop there for a second. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus. Now when we read about Jesus going through the countryside, we read that multitudes followed him. We read that multitudes were ministered to by him. Multitudes were healed by him. Oh, the multitude said, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And they threw palm branches on the, on the ground while he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. We know he had 12 disciples, but we also know there was another group of 70. So here we are at the cross. Let's see who's there. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, here it is, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. Wow, where did everybody go? Where did all his supporters go? Where are all those that said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord? See, praise the Lord is is easy when the Lord's popular, right? But praising the Lord isn't so easy when he's not popular. Verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, here it is, one more person's there, and the disciple standing by whom the Lord loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. And he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. When Jesus was arrested at the betrayal of Judas, the Bible records in Matthew 26, 56, Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. But when we read John chapter 19, we find only one disciple who is standing at the foot of the cross. And it's John. Why do you think John's there? Because of love? You see, John is the apostle of love, isn't he? And John is at the foot of the cross willing to be identified with this man who has just been crucified and mocked. John demonstrated his love for the Lord by being willing to be associated with him in his seeming defeat, humiliation, and death. The women were there, I understand that. But it wasn't as dangerous for the women to be there as it was for his disciples to be there because they, were, would, they would be then seen as his, his uh, associates and his cohorts and his disciples. And so it, there was some danger there that would exist to the men that wouldn't exist to the women. But he was willing to take the chance, if we can put it that way, because of his love for the Lord Jesus. When we read chapter 21, if you want to go there, and verse 20, verse 21 and verse 20, it says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith, Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? We see John is indeed the one whom the Lord loved. 
He's the one who was leaning on Jesus' breast. He is the one whom Peter, when he wanted to ask a question of the Lord, he asked John to ask Jesus because John seems to have been the one that was the closest to Jesus. He was the one that was, had, had, had the most endearment for Jesus. And he's the one that's at the cross. John's actions, prompted by his love for Jesus, demonstrated that love by being at the cross when all others avoided its association. Remember, it was John that wrote God is love. Remember, it was John that wrote love is of God. Now turn with me to 1 John. 1 John. The same man who wrote the gospel wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. But we go to 1 John chapter 2 and we look at verse 5. And here's what John, the apostle of love, says. He says, but whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God, what? Perfected. Now, the love of God is already shed abroad in our hearts. But that love is perfected when we obey the commands of the Lord. When we keep his word. That love of God in us is perfected or it comes to fruition. It comes to maturity as we obey his word. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. He says the same thing. Here it is. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are, are not grievous. So this is the love of God. Now, if we're not keeping his commandments, that's the love of us. But if we're keeping his commandments, that's the love of God. The love of God enables us to keep his commandments because when we love the Lord, his commandments are not grievous to us. See, there's, there's a lot of things that I will do for my wife that are not grievous to me to do them. It's not a burden for me to do them. Why? Because I love her. Now, if somebody else asked me to do it, it might be a burden to me. I might do it, but I would look at it as, wow, grievous. But I don't look at it as grievous for her. Why? Because of love. So when God's love, when we're keeping God's word, His love is being perfected in us. When we're keeping God's word, it is His love that's keeping His word. See? And we're keeping His word because we love Him. What did Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, I want you to give a lot of money. If you love me, I want you to do a lot of stuff. If you love me, I want you to climb a mountain. If you love me, I want, I want you to go to Timbuktu. He, no, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how I'll know you love me. Now, he knows all things, you understand. But what I'm saying is Peter's love was debatable because of the actions. John's love is demonstrated because of his actions. So Peter's actions prompted debate prompted debate as to his love of Jesus, while John's actions demonstrated to others his love of Jesus. You following me here? So I wonder what, what our love for Jesus does. Does our love or our actions, do they cause people to debate whether we love the Lord? Or do our actions cause people to see a demonstration that we love the Lord? All right, and my third point is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we see point number 3, love's deportment. Here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So Paul's saying, listen, if we've been saved, we're not supposed to live unto ourselves. We're not supposed to live for ourselves. We're supposed to live unto him. We're supposed to live for him. Why? Because of his love for us and because of our love for him. Paul's deportment, the way he carried himself, the way he lived, who he was, what he was, what he did, and why he did it were the product of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He says the love of Christ constraineth us. That word constraineth has two meanings. It means controls and it means um, compels. He's saying it's the, my love for Jesus that controls me. It's my love for Jesus that compels me. What could possibly compel Paul to do what he did? His love of Christ. What could possibly con- cause such control over Paul that he would live like he lived? His love of Christ. Why are you doing that, Paul? I love the Lord. Why do you live like that, Paul? I love the Lord. Do you remember that John referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved? It was the truth of Christ's love for John that motivated him just as it was the Apostle Paul. And they found Christ's love for them so compelling that it changed their lives and it changed the reasons for their living. Folks, when, when we get a hold of the love of Christ for us, it'll compel us and it'll control us and it'll change us. And when we get a hold of the love of God in us for Jesus, it'll do the same thing. I also see in this verse, of course, their love for Christ. They were what they were, something they had never been before because they loved the Lord so much. They did what they never would have done because they loved the Lord so much. They endured what they never could have endured because they loved the Lord so much. Remember, the Bible says charity or love suffereth long, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, beareth all things, and never faileth. Doesn't that describe the actions of both John and Paul? They were willing, if need be, to suffer for their association with Christ. They were not seeking what was best for themselves, but what would most glorify the Lord Jesus. Their love did not fail the Lord when it really counted. When, when, it, when the chips were down, there was John at the foot of the cross. What a comfort that must have been to Jesus to be able to hang there in all his agony and shame and to look down and see one disciple. You know, he must have said in his heart, there's one that loves me. Thank you, my father, for John. It must have been a great delight to the Lord to see a man like Paul who has really got it and really lived for the Lord. Why? Because he loved him. Paul, in effect, is saying he would not be doing what he was if it were not that Jesus loved him so much and he loved Jesus so much. It's his love for me and my love for him. It's our relationship that compels me. It's our relationship that controls me. Love will take you where nothing else can take you. And love will enable you when nothing else will enable you. And love will keep you when everything else fails. Love never fails. Remember that the Lord said that men would know us by our what? By our love. Now we certainly know John because of his love for the the Lord. And we certainly know that Paul, he loved the Lord. And I hope that My prayer is that my love for the Lord will never be debated, always demonstrated, and the power of my deportment. How about you? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You know, tonight we heard about two men, three men actually, Peter, and his love was debated. John and Paul, whose love, uh, John, whose love was demonstrated, and Paul, whose love was the reason for his deportment, the way he was. Maybe as we think about this as Christians, we could ask ourselves, Lord, do I have that kind of love? Do I understand your love for me enough that it makes a difference in my life?
And do I carry within my heart a love for you that compels me and controls me? That I am what I am because I love you? I do what I do because I love you. I don't do what I don't do because I love you. Do I have love that seeketh not its own? Or do I only have a human love that seeks my own? And maybe tonight as Christians, we could come before the Lord and say, Lord, I need a little bit of what Paul had. I need a little bit of what John had. And I know Peter loved you, Lord, but I don't want it to be debatable about me. I don't want people to wonder if I love Jesus. Maybe we need to come pray about that tonight. And if you're not saved here tonight, you've never been born again, I want you to know this. God loves you. I can't even explain how much he loves you. Other than to say this, he sent his only begotten son. And Jesus loves you. And I can't even plumb the depths of his love, but I can tell you this, he loved you enough to die for you on Calvary's cross and rise again so he could offer you eternal life. And the Holy Spirit loves you and he is, loves you so much, he's willing that if you trust Christ as your Savior, he's willing to come and live in you and seal you and keep you till the day of redemption. Wouldn't you like to have this love? The love that brings salvation? You say, preacher, I would like to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal relationship. I would like to experience the great love of God by trusting Christ as my Savior. If that's what you want to do, I want you to look up at me right now. You look up, and by looking at me, you're saying, preacher, I need what you talked about tonight. I want to know the love of God in my personal experience because I have a personal relationship with Christ by grace through faith. I need that. Father, we thank you this evening that you love us more than we can even imagine. And Father, we thank you that the love of God sent Jesus and the love of Jesus took him to that cross to endure the agony and shame of Calvary because he loved us. And Father, I just pray tonight that you'd help us to get a little better understanding and appreciation of that love for us and help us to have a greater love for Jesus, a love that compels us and controls us. I pray you'd bless the invitation, Father, as only you can. If there's anyone in this room or anyone listening or listening that need Christ as Savior, help them to know their need and to pray and call upon the name of the Lord before it's too late. Help them to come meet me at the front if they're here. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn, number 567. Why don't you come and talk to the Lord? All your anxiety, you know. The Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. And how can we have perfect love? Well, when we keep His commandments, we obey his word, his love is perfected in us. Do you understand? When we're obeying the word of God, we'll have a love that casts out fear. Maybe we just need to talk to the Lord a little bit tonight. Why don't you come? If that's what you need to do. And if you'd like to know more about being saved, I'd like you to come and see me and I'll help you with it, all right? As we sing on the first. Is there a heart or bound by sorrow is there a life weighed down by care come to the cross each burden bearing all your anxiety leave it there all your anxiety Oh uh -huh.
piety, all your care. Bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. Thank you for the, this reminder of love, Father. As sinners, Lord, we do not love you the way we should. Father, uh, we ask for your forgiveness, Father. We ask for your help, Lord, in this area of love. Lord, just uh, please help us to be mindful of it as we go day by day and how we treat each other, how we treat others, Father, how we treat the world. Father, help us to be different, Lord. Help us to love others like, uh, like we should, Father. And Lord, just thank you for this reminder. Thank you for tonight. Lord, and just ask for your blessing upon the Lord's table to follow, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.